In this video, you'll learn how you as a service design professional can significantly increase the impact design has on your organization by collaborating with the design ops folks. Here's the guest for this episode. Let the show begin. Hello, I am Heidi, and this is the Service Design Show, episode 182. Hi, my name is Mark Fontaine, and welcome back to the Service Design Show. On this show, we explore what's beneath the surface of service design. What are the hidden and invisible things that make the difference between success and failure? All to help you design great services that have a positive impact on people, business, and our planet. Our guest in this episode is Heidi Eitanen. Heidi is the head of design ops at Hannes and Maritz and the co-lead at the Design Ops Assembly Sweden. It's not a secret that most organizations are not set up to work in a design-driven way. If you work in such an environment, you probably feel the pain and frustration every single day. It's hard to deliver your best work when the supporting structures are not in place. Well, if you've been following the show for a while, you'll know that design ops is a field that I'm really excited about. And apparently I'm not the only one as design op is being adopted by more and more leading organizations around the world. The design ops community has taken on the daunting task of putting the systems, tools and processes in place which allow design to impact the organization in a transformative way. And that's even not all. Design Ops tries to make sure that designers feel at home, that their contributions are recognized, and that they feel that there is a future for them inside their organization. So we as a service design community can benefit a lot from the hard work done by our Design Ops friends. But here's the kicker. According to Heidi, design ops need service design as much as we need them. Heidi says that in essence, design ops is service design. Sounds intriguing, right? If you want all the details, make sure you stick around till the end of this episode because we'll be exploring how you can use service design to design an organization where design can actually thrive. When is the right time to set up a dedicated design ops role and how you get buy-in from senior management to invest in all of this. I hope this got you excited about what's coming up because now it's time to jump into the conversation with Heidi. Welcome to the show, Heidi. Thank you, Mark. Awesome Glad to, to have you here. on. Yeah, yeah. Awesome to have you on, like I always say. Uh, but it is uh, so interesting to hear different perspectives on service design and anything that's sort of vaguely related to it. And uh, today we're going to be on the fringes of service design with the topic of uh, design ops. But before we dive into that, um, Heidi, you have a very interesting uh, role, at least I consider it to be a very interesting role. For the people who haven't uh, looked you up on LinkedIn yet, could you share a little bit about what you do these days? Yes, absolutely. Uh, so I'm uh, leading design operations at H&M. Um, I've been there two, two years now. Uh, started as a team of one and now scaled it up. Uh, so we, or my team, uh, takes care of anything around the design organization that makes our designers and researchers thrive at their jobs, basically. Uh, mm. Yeah. Concentrate on the design part and, and so on. Making designers thrive at their job. That sounds like a very interesting and fascinating job to have. Uh, we'll dive into that much deeper uh, later on. Heidi, as a tradition, we have the lightning round. Five questions to get to know you even better as a person next to the professional. You don't know which questions are coming, uh, but the goal is to answer them as quickly and as briefly as possible. Just the first thing that comes to your mind. Are you ready? I'm ready. What is your secret superpower? Enthusiasm. 
it takes it takes to magical places. <laughs> okay. Um, your favorite holiday destination, what would that be? Um, I would have to take Chile as a country because it's so long that it has anything. So once I'm there, I can choose anything between beach, desert or uh, glaciers. Oh, Chile. <laughs> Noted. Um, what is always in your fridge? I have small kids, so milk. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I recognize that. What's the movie that could that you could watch for the rest of your life on replay? Grease. <laughs> the musical. <laughs> All righty. And uh, fifth and final question. Do you recall the moment that you first heard about service design? Ooh. Not sure about the moment but or how it happened, but the first moment would probably be in my actual very like first job when I was asked to do or go into the library and like try to do this and this and this and then note it down as a customer journey. I was like, okay, so search around customer journeys and gaming like across the word service design. Yeah, a lot of people have a similar experience. Cool. Well, that was an easy uh, lightning round. Thank you, uh, Heidi. Uh, good to know that uh, you're going to e move to Chile one day. Um, the topic of today is, as you mentioned, design ops is service design. That's very interesting and fascinating. So I have so many questions about that. Um, but first, I would love to understand a bit more about your journey, how did you get into design ops? So could you give us a brief overview of how did you get into your current role? Trying to hold it brief, but uh, this is a longer story. So originally, uh, going way back, I'm, uh, I graduated as Master of Arts in uh, graphic design. But my very, very first job was uh, in like a cross-functional uh, pop-up studio where we had different kinds of designers. We had like an, a graphic designer, an interaction designer, an interior designer, a design project lead, uh, architect. I can't even remember like all of, but everyone had like some sort of a design background. And I guess that was my very first introduction to it, like, involving people and having multiple perspectives and what a difference it makes when you start looking into a broad solution within design. Like, you know, as a, from a graphic design perspective, we could make signage that help people in a store find ecological products, but then you got in all the other design perspectives um, and it became a much wider and a systematic approach. Uh, and this really shaped me as a professional. So from the very first, like early on, I didn't go into like the nitty gritty of uh, graphic design, or, uh, but more on a, a experience level of things and how can you elevate design projects um, to be more holistic, uh, I guess. Uh, and from there on, I've worked very broadly with different identities, branding, product, uh, licensing, games. Uh, and then I moved, I'm from Finland originally, and then I moved um, to Sweden uh, when I switched from sort of physical uh, product design into the UX uh, world and digital services. Uh, and it's only then I sort of actually had at some point a title of being a service designer, but it's I identify as a person that has always had this mindset. And the more I... Um, did hands-on work or something, the more I realized that this is my identity as a designer. Uh, and then I sort of worked um, in different uh, contexts and got into innovation and innovation management uh, and also run product development in a startup. Uh, but products design ops is quite new as a as a discipline or as a like as a framed uh, job. So to say, it's it's things that people have always done, but I kind of followed the conversation um, from uh, when it started emerging, let's say probably 2018, something like that. Uh, and then I, um, no, no, 2014, 2015, after I had moved to Sweden. Uh, and then I had, it was a very good moment in my uh, uh, my life when I, I didn't want to continue a journey in a startup. 
to search for something. And then I saw that H&M is looking for a specific role in design ops. Uh, and I read it and I read it many times and I'm like, but do I, is, is this something that I'm like, I have competence for? And to be honest, in the very first, early on, I was thinking, this is very new to me. Like, is it, is it something that I will sort of venture on? But now, like, you know, having been in this role for some time, I feel that uh, it, it actually wasn't that new. It was just a new context for the skill set that I already had. And that's kind of why I'm here. It's like, I, I think design ops is service design. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, super interesting. So I, I realize that not everybody might be familiar with the term design ops. We've had some episodes with interesting guests who talked about this topic, but I know not everybody listens to every episode. And I'm sure that there are a million definitions of design ops out there, but I'm just curious, what is your perspective on what design ops is? Ooh, what a good question. So we, in, in my team at H&M, we say that we are, our team creates a home uh, for the designers and researchers, uh, the design community at H&M. And what we mean with that is a home. Uh, it, we don't mean that you are a family and you need to sort of, you know, commit in the way. I don't really like that analogy that you think that your workplace is a home because it's different rules. But with the home, what we mean with operations is when you are at home, you feel um, that you know how things work. Uh, you know how where you go to get something. Uh, you know how you can change things because you feel confident and you trust uh, the environment and other people. You are You feel psychologically safe. And operations basically takes care of that thing. So it's turning the design eye inwards for the design community, not anymore for the customer, but how do we enable designers to be able to deliver the best possible work for the customers while thriving at their jobs? Mm. And do, um, do designers need to have that specifically? Because I don't... Re call that there is something as HR ops or CEO ops. Why is there a design ops? Good question. My answer to this is that uh, design is underrepresented almost in all of uh, the organizations. Uh, and when digital product development has bloomed, so all of the organizations have like a ratio of one designer to two to 10 engineers or something. So you're always like an underdog in the discussions. Uh, and still in many organizations, design feels as, you know, as like polishing a ground, like coming and helping in to support something in the business. It's not really considered a core business capability, but that's what it is. That's what design thinking and all of this is aiming for. So to help this group of people that are uh, already underrepresented, uh, design ops is like people who have 100% dedicated their time to help in that, to make the design maturity grow, to evangelize what the designers are there for, because they are dividing their attention between doing design, evangelizing design. Mm. Yeah, maybe it's because um, design, like most organizations aren't set up to be a design driven organization. They are much more set up to be a management oriented and driven organization. So maybe that explains something. Um, the other question yeah, true. that I have here is, so your perspective is design ops is service design, service design, especially design ops. If they are the same, why do we have two different names? I No, they're not the same, but mm. I, okay, maybe I should rephrase myself, but the skill set is transferable. Mm -hmm. uh, but what what makes it the same is that you you use the design methodology, uh, you use empathy, you use um, co-creation, prototyping, experimentation, just like in service design, but your sort of core target group is internal. That makes a big difference. So you're not sort of looking at the big uh, consumer or customer group, you're looking at the internal uh, stakeholders, which basically are your colleagues or your peers or your, you know, above, below, across, whatever. 
uh, this changes the dynamic, uh, but the skill set uh, that you are using in a design ops uh, practice is very similar. It's about driving engagement, uh, understanding people. Um, it's somehow fundamentally about change. Um, it's a service design often, or I worked uh, in the innovation field, but it's, you want to transform something. You have like a, an idea of what is the two state of where we want to go. And both service design and operations are the hands-on part on how do we actually get there. It's very actionable. You want to find these things of where can we make a difference and how can we make a difference? And then that you actually have methods, uh, frameworks to make that happen, like, you know, co-creation, facilitation, and so on. All of these are um, like my main assets in ops. And why it's, there is very many different kinds of design ops uh, functions in different organizations. It really depends on what the organization is and what is their needs, what is their maturity, and also who has hired for the design ops role and what was their vision originally. There are people who come from business operations. There are people with like heavy operational program management background, but more and more, uh, according to like a state of design ops uh, report, it's now over 50% that come from a design background. So our designers. Uh, so I don't know, with my example, I kind of want to encourage people with the service design background and mindset uh, to, to think of that kind of a transfer of career, if you want to think of it uh, like that, because the way the way I see that operations can, it can turn a whole organization around. Because if you think like strategy often is somewhere in a deck, but it, how does it change things? It's through the operations. If you understand both strategy and operations and can tie this together, which is ultimately what all service designers are trying to do, you will you can make a difference on many fields. And for operations, I have now, for myself, I've coined it as the future of work. So being able through one competence, through the design competence um, to to change how we work hmm. is that change that operations does and the change like it can be the future of whatever the future of packaging the future of kitchens the future of something that service designers uh that are looking outwards often work with and are working with that kind of a change so there's the how i see the similarity super interesting and you're i i totally get uh that you are basically applying the service design mindset methodology approach tools and methods onto the organization and more in this case maybe even more specifically onto the facilitating enabling designers within an organization to do their best work but it probably also then extends to other functions and just the way people collaborate i'm i'm really interested um if we make this a bit more even a bit more tangible can you give some examples of challenges or projects that you and your team have worked on, on how is this changing the way of working within H&M? Yes. Things that At aren't least... confidential. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, many. We have started with very fundamental blocks. So maybe I will take the first uh, example. Uh, we build the very first career framework that was a design specific um, for our community. Uh, and how, like how I see this as a service design project is that I handled it exactly as it would have been a service design project. So what you basically need is a framework and then you need the content to fill the framework. Um, so then the two, like it, it was a very holistic approach to like, we had six different uh, uh, roles within design that all needed their own uh, path and levels and then requirements and like what lenses are we using? Uh, so I did a lot of uh, industry research on what others have done and 
what has worked well, what is the most simplified version, what is the most granular version on different frameworks. Then I had, then, then we come into the one sort of basic, <clears throat> uh, <coughs> sorry, the service design rule of always including people and making it about co-creation. So I call this the co-creation bonanza, because at that time we were like 120 people and I somehow managed to include the majority of these people in creating the content. But if we start with um, the, the framework, so we had a selected group of people where I made like, uh, I think it's Mark Stickdorn who talks about the first shitty draft. So the first shitty draft of a framework, like this is what we could have. These are the level, we have junior, key, senior, and so on. We look through these lenses and these are, you know, like how you could start uh, putting in some requirements. And then I gathered feedback and iterated a couple of times. And then we landed with like uh, three lenses of uh, the craft. Uh, so what, what is it that you actually do? Uh, your mindset, uh, how you do it, the behaviors uh, that you put into your work. And then the third one, your presence. So within your context and what is sort of the reach and influence of your role. And then we had the steps from junior to a principal, uh, and then for each of those steps, each of these lenses, a description of what is like, what is expected for this level for craft, mindset, and presence. Um, and then we had like a set of core skills that is for like we had a product designer, service designer, UI designer, UX researchers, UX writers, and so on. And so then I took each competence uh, on its own and we crafted um, uh, the like first, first shitty draft in that area that the framework was also done, but the first sort of content, which was more like trigger material for the people to react to. Uh, and then as they had done that individually, then we hold like a gathered uh, workshop together where we talked about it, like what is, what is the... Uh, should we say it in this way? And what is like, uh, if we in principle level, for example, say that we, uh, 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 it's about uh, your presence in the industry. What do we mean with that? Is that feasible? Uh, and the biggest group of was product designers. Of course, that was like 80 some uh, people. And there we did it asynchronously <clears throat> in Miro and others we did more uh, on a Teams workshop setup. Um, and how it started changing uh, uh, the behavior and works, ways of working, it was because people were involved, they were more engaged and they felt that they had some sort of ownership uh, of the, the framework. So they felt that this is, it's more mine and I mm -hmm. can contribute it going forward with. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the second part was that it, we started rolling it out to the, the management uh, layer. So people managers, how should we do uh, like re repetitive one-on-ones? -on how should we do quarterly reviews? How should we take this uh, framework into actual discussions on one-on-one, -on -one, which are, you know, not that <laughs> frameworked into a structure, but I, as a designer, I can use it in this way to reflect that I think that I want to grow towards this direction. Is it the IC path or is it the management path? It was like, it it changed the way designers could articulate uh, where they are, where they want to go. And they had more tangible vocabulary, terminology, and an actual framework to refer to. And for managers to have more tangible and actually evaluating that from their perspective, that yes, okay, I see, I see that that you um, what do you mean with that, but maybe I can have like a broader view. So, what is expected of a senior in this context uh, means in practice, because the framework is very general, means this. So managers can give actual examples that bring the framework to life. So I think it. It made, I think it made the biggest change that it did. It made interest in career and it, your own development much bigger because it gave words uh, to things. 
I think we've talked the past two years that this has existed or one and a half. We talked about career and development much more than before. So, wow, uh, super interesting topic. And like it's designing on a meta level, like you're designing for design and you're using uh, a design approach to get to an artifact that is useful to mature the des design practice within an organization. Discussing career frameworks has been on the show as well, and it seems so important and it's uh, fascinating and obvious to see that you, when you design, you when you want to create, create a design, a framework, career framework for designers that you should do it in a design driven approach. Like that makes a lot of sense. Um, you mentioned already something about, uh, it depends who's hiring and like, what was the vision for bringing in design ops. So for instance, in this, in your case, creating something like a career framework, it takes time from the organization. There has to be someone who owns it. There has to be a need. There has to be, I guess, a perceived return on investment. Who do you? Who is driving design ops? Where is the need uh, from the organization coming from? Am I making sense? Yes, or let us see how when yes. I answer, yes. if I answer <laughs> the correct uh, question. I think from our case or what I hear, the main sort of driver is the design managers layer that hear the needs from the designers all the time and don't maybe really have the tools and the time. So they want, they discuss, and we have a very, uh, I joined quite late. <laughs> so we already had like multiple different ways of working um, in an organization. So like it comes to a point that like uh, design managers need to think a lot and, and, you know, agree on who's going to work with that, who's going to work with that, which are maybe holistic needs like onboarding or offboarding or design reviews or something. But then their needs in their context change and they might not have time and the frustration uh, sort of escalates. And then they are pushing the need that we need, you know, allocated uh, people who look into this. Uh, and then the second need is, of course, also for the actual design, uh, head of design or whoever is running uh, the department uh, that, depending on where the organization is, but to be able for them to more strategically concentrate on where to take it, uh, how, how do we, how do we want to go and where do we want to be? Uh, so they have also a need to take parts of the operational uh, uh, part of their work to someone else uh, that they can collaborate um, better. Uh, and now I had, I'm thinking of another thing in my head, but it's just kind of like the idea slipped. So let me ask you an in-between question yeah. and your idea will <laughs> yes. uh, get back. In, in what I'm hearing you say is that the need for design ops emerged from the fact that you already had a pretty big design community and there were challenges and needs arising from the fact that it was just growing in sheer volume. There were uh, pain points started to emerge, needs started to emerge with, which weren't being addressed by the existing organization. And then sort of it was be becoming clear that you need something that floats above the design community and helps them to facilitate them in doing their work. So it emerged from the existing design community within H&M, correct? Is, is that a good assumption? Yes, yes, correct. And, and to make things more smooth and effective, I think yes. I came in when we were like, we had boosted uh, the community from 14 people to 120. It was a lot. Uh, so then when people work in so different contexts, uh, you have very senior people coming in and then you have more junior people coming in and they all sort of shape in their context because we work, you know, a designer in a product team with a lot of other competencies. They make their own set of ways of working for design. They evangelize design in their context in a different way. They talk about, just to give a very, very concrete example, the design process. It's the double diamond in somewhere. It's like uh, 
some other process somewhere, some say discovery, some say pre-study, some say research, and what they mean with that is completely different things. And then in other contexts, designers are asked to do, you know, the change of the button uh, color, and in some other contexts they are, you know, they do consumer research. So to align these more, that the actual organization can um, work more effectively, and then mm -hmm. also that the leaders in this organization can lead uh, to a similar direction and say that this is design and this is not design mm -hmm. in our context. This is sort of when ops. Yeah, well, you're creating standards and things that you can agree upon as an organization, as a community, as a practice, uh, which is which becomes more important when you want to scale the impact of design and just the volume of this, the amount of design work that's being done. The question that I had in my mind, and this is always hard to judge in hindsight, but is there like, what's the right moment to start introducing design ops? Ideally, you'd start with design ops and then sort of grow the design practice based on that. But I can imagine that it's it's a hard sell when people within the organization don't feel the problems of alignment and standardization yet. So what what do you think is a good moment to bring design ops in? The earlier, the better, mm -hmm. I would say. Yeah, well. <laughs> but I have started, I've started to think more that it's, it's not maybe the actual amount of designers that sh should be the answer here, because that's hard to, it depends of so many other factors. But what I believe in is to start naming design ops early on. From the very beginning, anyone is starting to build an internal uh, design uh, community. That these parts of your work are design ops. And then make it more explicit that we, we have a design ops mindset. Everyone in the community or some people in the community allocate a percentage, half of their time for ops related tasks and that you store them uh, like what you do in a place that is called something ops. <laughs> so when you start seeing the need and the people's interest grow that I don't want to do ops anymore. I just want to design, uh, you know, for end users and end solutions, or I really enjoy seeing the growth in our community with the work I do. Then you start having the individual drivers of where I want to go, and then you connect it to the need. So when you start having more, you see that the amount of ops work that you have labeled, it will increase. So when it goes to like a threshold that this is one person's uh, full-time job, then that person and that interest make it a match and make it official that now you actually have a role. And this can happen in any time. It can happen in teams that you have 10 designers, but it can also go far with designers that are 50. But if they have a very good chemistry and they work well with each other and they have established, uh, managed to establish standards together, it doesn't have to be a specific role. So a little just, bit of vague yeah, of an well, answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I get it. Then it's super smart. So you're, uh, even without design ops being officially recognized or having an official role in the organization, you're, assigning work to that label. You're already labeling some of your work to design ops, just as you might label your work to research or to strategy or to implementation. You're assigning, I've spent, I don't know, eight hours this week working on making sure that we can actually do our job on, on designing the organization. And you just label that and keep track of that as early on as possible. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah, giving and giving and that's what we're doing also now, even though we have a dedicated team, our community is so big and complex that we're kind of, we're kind of re, uh, what is the word, like reversing uh, the process that I just uh, described. So we are thinking that we need to implement a design because like when when you first hire for a big organization, someone who has the responsibility of design ops. When I joined, I was, I was bombarded with different kinds of needs on all levels, like, you know, to solve the product design process to very small things like, what, how does the printer work somewhere? <laughs> well, but anyway, it's like everything in between. 
So then th there can be this moment where people are like uh, very relieved that we have operational people who are taking care of this. But it, if it's still a small team, you will always need this design of mindset. So labeling uh, really helps that what you are actually doing now is helping the design ops team, at, but you're doing ops in your context. Uh, so we're, we're, we're still on that path. <laughs> Is there a silly question, but is there like an overview of things that fall under the umbrella of design ops? So if I would want to start labeling this, I would like to know, like, is there, does the design ops community have, uh, what is it? I don't know, a list of activities that I could say, okay, oh, hmm, so this is design ops. Is, is that, is that list there? Uh, it, yes and no. There's probably many. Uh, mm. So people have their own. Like I said before, design ops can look very different uh, from organization to organization. And some in some other context, uh, design ops could be very like administrative, very tactical focused, very here and now. And it's always part of some part of every design ops. Uh, but then you also have design ops that is very holistic, very strategic, partnering up with strategic leadership to actually change from ground up uh, how the organization works. And this is where we again come to service design. I can talk about it later mm. um, a bit with actually seeing design as organization rather than team. Uh, but yes, to go back to the list. Uh, so, for example, in our context, we have three pillars in ops. We call them processes and assets, community and culture, and career and growth. So then you take those pillars and you take the idea of this is something where I turn my, uh, my, my site inwards. So am I doing something for my colleagues, for my peers in the processes and assets, creating something that others can reuse? Or community and culture, sharing my knowledge, organizing some sort of events, communicating, like anything that, everything that has to do with communication is ops basically, uh, or career uh, and growth. Am I doing some sort of peer learning uh, things? Am I mentoring? Uh, all of those things fall under the umbrella of ops in our context. Yeah, so that, yeah that's uh, already a, a, a very good starting point. Like you don't need, you don't want to make it too complex. And these three things, these three pillars, make a lot of sense um if i can add to that because that is one of the things that i also felt that um having been the first uh design ops person at h&m how my service design background help because uh, i established those pillars and the scope but it needed to be exactly like you said simple enough to communicate because the entire organization was very new. Like, what is design ops? What are you supposed to be doing? How am I supposed to communicate this so that people actually understand? Uh, and in service design, the sort of the, the mindset of not being stuck with buzzwords so much, but like it, the, uh, the the core of it is always to make people understand so they can act upon something. Was something that also iterated a couple of times like what is simple enough for people to understand what's what could be in our scope then i had another problem that i was alone and my scope was gigantic uh, so yeah you learn things while you do it <laughs> well uh continuing on uh, a too big scope uh, I, I was curious like what is the hardest thing in your work what's the most challenging aspect people <laughs> people are the the core of everything but it's I mean, I've noticed in everything that we do, it, the, the hardest part is always adaptation to get it uh, to something that people use. And that's, of course, the first level, but that's something that people also um, love, something that people develop on their themselves and keep iterating, giving feedback on. Um, that That is hard. And also taking yourself, I think, more designing for designers, you need to take even more yourself out of the process. Like it, it really, really is continuous iteration in the way that, okay, well, we tried this, but obviously it did not work. And then you just, you know, kill your darlings and try something else. 
So uh, when you mentioned uh, adoption and people need to uh, own it, what's what do you see as holding people back from adopting these ideas? I mean, rituals and, and things like how people have, what have they adopted during the years in their design? They're used to doing things in a certain way. They have a, a sort of grounded uh, behavior in something that has worked in their context very well before. So they are, everyone is likely to repeat uh, similar things. Uh, so I think the keys here is like to be able to prove the value of guidelining or standardization, uh, but also the flexibility. It's like a standard should never be like a nail in the coffin. It's, it needs to be flexible so that it, it's open for interpretation, it's open for feedback, it's open for iteration, but in a cohesive way. So it's a lot to think when you launch something. Um, if you la launch it too uh, loose, you risk that it, like some adopt, some doesn't adopt at all, but then they will develop it into completely different uh, uh, um, directions, which is not a problem uh, as itself. But then when you, as a centralized function, try to iterate the second iteration, you will either go one way or the other. So you will lose people who have iterated on themselves to the other direction, or people who have feel that they have actually iterated further where you have come. So I think it's, you need to carefully balance uh, standardization and sort of freedom, flexibility within that. And then it comes back to just talking people, talking to people, involving people, co-creating. I can imagine that that is like such a hard balance or what a, the thin line to, to walk because, you know, when, when it's a top down thing, it's really hard to get people to adopt it. Uh, and the other challenging thing is you don't, like you don't want to make it too loose, like you said, because then like, what's the purpose of trying to find this a common language? And it sort of has to emerge from the design community. So you're almost just like as a designer, you're harvesting what's already there and trying to form formalize it, make it tangible and say, is this what we as a design community within H&M agree upon like is this what we're doing you're, you're almost trying to again make what's already there what's implicitly already there explicit correct correct yes and a lot of the work that my team does is to to dig those best practices and and the success stories in the organization articulated into a general matter of what actually happened here label it name it and then communicate it Mm -hmm. uh, and then after that, it doesn't really stop there. Then you have to sort of actually go into the adaptation part. Like, how would you roll it out? How would you launch it? Who should you approach? Do you need some sort of supporting material? And I think the change and also the, the ability for service designers, especially to zoom in and out in ops is super useful because you can have this like big strategic goal of becoming a customer centric organization, for example. Uh, but how does change actually happen? It's through the rituals that people are already doing. So if you can connect a story from, for example, how do you name a file? Like, okay, I'm just making up this uh, uh, as, as I go, but we made a like an H&M design process. This is how it looks like. So if we call discovery, the a first phase discovery, how should we like just communicating that won't actually do anything, but where should we implement the label discovery so that people start adopting it? So if you would, for example, start naming files, discovery, something, something, it's, it's much more than just labeling the file because it's, if you do it consistently, you will go on like very, very small steps towards the goal of changing the mindset towards the customer centric goal that you have also, uh, you know, driven with the whole uh, design leadership. And it's this, it's the connection. 
uh, in the stairs that I think also service design as a competence is very skillful in, which can be used in the operations field. <laughs> it's it's the uh, small details that aren't details, but that make the actual difference on a day-to-day level. Yes. That's, and, and I think it's so easy to overlook and ignore something small as naming of things while that is the thing that people get exposed to when they open their laptops and look at things so i i totally see how that can be uh yeah how that can make a big change one other question i had is related to looking at where you are today and looking into the future what do you feel is needed for design ops to be even more impactful, influential? What needs to happen? I think we're quite well on the way. I mean, maybe it's an obvious answer, but I would say more design ops practitioners that it has to do with the labeling that we talked about before, that people who are not a design ops something But when they talk about what they do, they use design obsessed terminology. Um, I see, I think in Europe, it feels a bit like, you know, design ops teams of one are popping up like mushrooms in the rain. And there's more and more. Um, And I felt strongly that when I started sharing uh, my journey and how it felt being uh, a team of one, it resonated with many and I got lots of feedback and contacts, uh, contacts and wanted to like share more so that people who are already in the field share more of what they're doing and how they see it without maybe being so afraid of the industry because the industry is changing. The design ops is not super defined and every single insight and opinion is very valued and it shapes other people. Uh, in the industry and like just how do you like how do you hire what are the role names and then when you see that you have used something that someone else uses and then someone else used the thing that you used we start to create more and more definition um, so yeah I hope that answered <laughs> just getting more people aware that this exists and uh that this is a career that you also can pursue and that there's uh, interest from organizations uh, to invest in designers. Yeah. Yeah. And then also, I think, like designers in communities that have had a design ops, uh, if you've worked in an organization that has and that ha- doesn't have a design ops, like if you would reflect what is the difference and how, how did you feel it? Because it's although... Like, for example, our design of function works a lot with community and sort of the feeling of togetherness and that we can share. We are many here. How how does that actually influence the employee experience of being a designer in a context? And how does that influence um, sort of the happiness level of being at work as a designer? And I think that, for example, just looking back at my career, I felt often that I, it's many times, I think many people feel it, that it's it's often a fight to other competencies, to other, you need to prove, you need to do this and that. It can be exhausting. So if you can lower that even a little, and if you can actually feel the difference, and if you talk about that feeling, then you have design leaders that are sort of listening into the designers that we, I felt so much better when we had this, even if you can't exactly pinpoint what it was that someone did, but sort of the overall feeling of being at work. Um, I think ops can play a crucial role for design. So uh, seems like a great mission to be on and something <laughs> uh, worth waking up and uh, going to work for. Uh, maybe one final question before we wrap up and you already mentioned something about looking back. When you look back at your career and think uh, maybe about the moment before you got into design ops, what do you wish you had known or that somebody had told you uh, about design ops before you got into it that you know today? I think that how immensely gratifying it can be to see the results in an internal community. Like I think 
for a designer, it you come to like, do I want to leave the hands-on craft and actually designing, or do I want to leave the customer, the actual innovative solutions and turn towards the internal community? Like, is, is that worth the same? Is it, is it like a little bit of a, you know, smaller, uh, impact, smaller scale, smaller, like these kind of doubts. But now having been here and like, you see results immediately, you get immediate feedback, like within a day of something that you've launched. And then, you know, like after a couple of months doing some sort of a survey of like, how the, like how many people to feel more control of their career after a career framework or something like that. And seeing the numbers that it has pushed the needle somewhere, it comes so fast compared to, you know, working outwards. I also worked as a consultant with different companies and contributed a lot to a lot of work that I kind of maybe never really got any information of the actual result then after. Uh, I feel that the meaning uh, of the work that I do is so great. And when I joined, I maybe didn't expect it to mm. or had doubts about that but it feels mm. so meaningful and being able to see the results is like the the cherry on the cake that that keeps me going <laughs> well uh, uh my conclusion from that is that uh designers are a very good user group to be working for <laughs> because oh, those yeah, the are... best. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's good to know um Heidi, thanks so much. I'm uh, sure that we'll be hearing a lot more about the signups in the future. I hope that we will, because I do see so much overlap and benefits of integrating these two communities, getting them more and more uh, connected. So uh, I'm going to ask you for some recommendations of other design ops uh, leaders to get on the show, because I think we need to have a good conversation with each other and see how we can strengthen each other. Thanks so much for coming on and uh, sharing your thoughts and your journey with us. Uh, I found it super helpful and super interesting. So yeah, thanks again. Thank you so much, Mark. And thank you for inviting me and keeping design ops on the agenda of service, service design. We are trailblazers here. Cool. <laughs> thank you. What's your take on the intersection between design ops and service design? Leave a comment down below and let's continue our conversation over there. If you've made it all the way here and enjoyed the episode, please do me a quick favor. Click the like button on this video if you haven't done so already. Not to feed the YouTube algorithm, but just to let me know if we're on the right track by addressing topics like this. My name is Mark Fontaine and I want to thank you for spending a part of your day with me. It's an absolute pleasure and honor. Please keep making a positive impact on the people around you. And I look forward to see you very soon in the next video.